Hello everyone, superhero movies, they're popular, I guess, there's a lot of them, I am awesome at intros. Okay, but seriously, superhero movies have just exploded throughout the last few decades, with hundreds of them being made, especially recently, since superheroes just kind of found their footing in the mainstream, at least to this massive level. Now, out of all the superhero movies that have been made, I think it's not too much of a stretch to say that maybe the most notable achievement in the genre is the Marvel Cinematic Universe, or the MCU. I mean, it's a universe that's able to juggle almost a hundred characters over like 20 movies, all of which tell a relatively linear plot, and it's very successful, and it's culturally groundbreaking. Sign me up. However, a lot of people tend to forget that there's this whole slew of Marvel movies that all take place outside of the MCU's continuity. Um, yeah, there's 40 of them, and I watched them all. Now, a lot of people remember a few of these, like, you know, the Raimi Spider-Man trilogy or the X-Men movies and Logan, but do you remember Dolph Lundgren's Punisher, released in 1989? Yeah, didn't think so. So all the movies that take place outside of the canon of the MCU are dubbed Marvel Legacy movies because... I don't know, ask Kevin. And with the MCU being in a state of... whatever it is right now, I thought that it would be a good idea to revisit these Marvel Legacy movies. Now real quick, I just wanted to go over a couple of rules. Uh, first off, there are a lot of movies in this video. Like I said, there's 40 of them. So since there's so many, I may have a lot to say about some of them, and for others, I may have, like, nothing to say. That's just kind of how it is. I don't make the rules. Well, I do, but... Shut up. Second thing I really wanted to drive home is that this is just my opinion. I'm not qualified to review all of these movies objectively. I I'm not trying to change your opinion. I'm just trying to share mine. That's the whole point of it. Just, just don't take it too seriously. Now, some of you may be asking yourselves, Tryin, how do these movies hold up? Was it even worth it? Are asparaguses self-conscious about the way that their pee smells? I can promise you that at least two of these questions will be answered by the end of this video. And yes, just fair warning, spoilers ahead for every single one. So, without further ado, let's jump into yet another dumpster fire of a video with... So yeah, this is what I started with, and uh, <laughs> uh, it was bad. It's not all bad though, uh, there are some actual positives in this movie. For the two minutes when he's actually Deadpool, Ryan Reynolds just kills it. Stuck in an elevator with five guys on a high-protein diet. Oh, wait. Dreams really do come true. So just shut it! In the third act of this movie, not so much, but we're gonna get to that. And this is the case for all these movies, so I'm just gonna say this now. Um, Hugh Jackman is freaking perfect as Wolverine. And I would genuinely put him up there with, like, Robert Downey Jr. as Iron Man level of, like, perfect casting. So, yeah. But other than that, uh, this is a bad movie. Every single trope in action movie history was utilized in the script. The unlikely group of heroes that were once the best, but they eventually become shattered, washed up versions of themselves. A villain who for some reason is related to the hero, and it has no weight or effect on the plot at all. A random popular musician of the time playing one of the characters that is... It makes no sense why he's there, but he is. Y you get the point. This is basically just Fast and Furious, but with mutants. And... I said we were gonna get to it. Deadpool is freaking massacred at the end of this movie. It's bad. They seriously turn one of the most iconic X-Men characters into a generic third act big bad. Uh, also, they turn Patrick Stewart into a NIGHTMARE! STOP! STOP! STOP IT! But yeah, <laughs> what an opener. For me, I'm gonna give it a 3 out of 10. Let's move on. This is the true introductory movie to the X-Men franchise. Th think of the last one as like chapter one of Red Dead 2, and this one is like chapter two of Red Dead 2, when the real game begins. This isn't as good as Red Dead 2, but it's a similar structure. 
First off, I wanted to say a couple of important things about all the X-Men movies. Already said, Hugh Jackman, perfect casting. But I think another Robert Downey Jr. Iron Man level casting is Patrick Stewart as Professor X. Patty Stew's the man. I mean, he's just the man. I mean, during the audition, I think he was initially unsure about taking the role. And then he basically read a comic and said, Oi, bruv, what, they wrote me into a bloody comic, innit? Put me in the mood. That's not how he sounds. I mean, if, if you even need convincing about this, look at this scene right here. Computer, go, massive breasts, Elsa portrait, wavy hair, Rosen, big breasts, Disney colors, illustration, concept art, digital painting, highly detailed, trending on art station, artist one, artist two, end game. Uh, second thing about all these movies in general, um, Magneto's the best. He, he, he is the best. Even in the bad movies, he's the best part. Uh, other than that, though, everyone else is just kind of serviceable. Uh, Plot-wise, it's very much like average superhero movie. You know, not bad, but just like, it's nothing really groundbreaking. But I think that that's exactly what a first movie needs to be. Like, it doesn't really need to be groundbreaking. I think it's smart to play it safe starting off because the audience genuinely does connect more with a streamlined plot at first before going into the super experimental sequel. But yeah, uh, this movie isn't incredible or anything, but I think it's pretty good. I like it. Uh, first X-Men, 7 out of 10. Let's move on. X2. This is the one that everyone talks about when you say X-Men movies. Like, it's either this one or, like, Logan. That's how high up this is ranked for a lot of people. This is one of the many that I had not actually seen going into this. The only ones that I had seen were the last one and Apocalypse. I saw Apocalypse before this one. How is this one? I'm going to be 100% honest. I like this one. I think it's better than the last one, but it just kind of feels the same. A lot of this does work very well. This is actually the first movie to delve into Wolverine's origins, and I really like the way they do it. It's told through, like, broken and shattered flashbacks, which is the same way that he sees it. And I think that's a really cool way to get Wolverine to connect with the audience. I like how Magneto teams up with the X-Men to unite against a common foe. I think it adds to one of my favorite parts of his character. How, on one hand, he's not really a villain. I mean, like, on paper, he is right, and he does have a point. Uh, on the other hand, genocide. Speaking of villains, I'm not the biggest fan of Stryker. I like the idea of Stryker, but I think that this execution just isn't the greatest. It, it doesn't really get me invested in the same way that, like, Magneto gets me invested. Uh, this is the movie where Nightcrawler gets introduced, and I think he works fine. I mean, like, he kills everyone in the White House in the first scene, and then just kind of stands there the rest of the movie. So yeah, I like this movie. I don't think it's the best one. I actually think it's kind of far from being the best X-Men movie. I just think that... It's maybe a little bit overrated, um, but anyway, it's still a good movie. 8 out of 10. The Last Stand. More like The Last Straw. Get it? Because this movie is disappointing. I mean, I honestly have no clue how the quality went down this far from the last one. It feels like this whole movie was just like an afterthought, and they didn't even really try to make it satisfying, like, at all. Uh, Jean Grey comes back, and it just doesn't feel right. She sort of comes out of nowhere and doesn't feel built up to at all. You know what else doesn't feel built up to at all? Patty Stu gets disintegrated! It just happens, like, a third into the movie? He didn't even go out in a satisfying way. It's like, oh yeah, boom, gone now, he's dust. Ah, sorry. Angel's okay, just kind of underwhelming. He doesn't do much. I think he probably should have done more. Same with Beast. He's just, he's just kind of works for the government. But really, it's like, not much in this movie is actually bad. It's just underwhelming. With one exception. The Juggernaut. Bitch. I'm the Juggernaut, bitch! In the final battle, I kid you not, the third act, the, the climax of the movie, he runs through a group of soldiers, and the editors play a bowling pin knocking over sound effect. They did that. But yeah, I don't think this movie's bad. It's just so underwhelming. Five out of ten, rip Patty Stu. 
this was one of the X-Men movies that I knew basically nothing about going into, and honestly, this one's kinda underrated. Sure, it's basically just a normal action movie with like an X-Men skin equipped, but it's a kinda good normal action movie. The whole premise is that Wolverine is mourning the death of Jean Grey since, I don't know, she did something to his Weapon X. Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a penis joke. You can laugh. The first act of this movie is practically a masterpiece. I mean, from the nuke scene to seeing how much Jean's death actually affected Jackie Boy as a character to the bar fight scene, awesome. I just wish that that first act was consistent with the tone of the rest of the movie because the rest is kinda corny. The second act is still good, don't get me wrong. I mean, the action scenes are great, like the train scene and the dojo sword fight, but otherwise, it just kind of drags on in terms of story. But really, where this movie loses the most points is in the third act. Because... Why? It is so bad. I mean, I actually hate it. The snake lady whatever is just the worst. I mean, I mean THE worst. I'm actually glad that this wasn't a superhero movie for the most part, because when it was, it sucked. Oh, and did I mention that? This don't even feel like a superhero movie! Wolverine gets his powers taken from him very early on, and doesn't even get him back until like the last few scenes. Now, this works for some movies. Yep, Spider-Man 2. Great example of like, a superhero losing his powers done well. But when there aren't really any stakes like in the Wolverine, it just doesn't go over well. Now, don't get me wrong, I, I still like the first two-thirds of this movie. I actually really like the first two-thirds of the movie. But the third act just drops it by so many points that it just really makes me sad. So yeah, I don't really have a lot to say on this movie other than slash slash snick snick snake lady can't act for shit. 7 out of 10. Let's move on. This is probably the most surprising movie that we watched since I hadn't heard much about it. But honestly... This movie slaps. This is where we were introduced to one of, if not the best character portrayal that came out of this whole franchise. Michael Fassbender's Magneto. This guy right here, see him? That guy? Incredible. Perfection. His portrayal of Magneto turned that character into maybe my favorite Marvel villain. I actually really like James McAvoy's Professor X. Nowhere near Patty Stu. But he does a great job as a young Charles. Two professors, one cop. <laughs> and also freaking Mystique. She actually gets some good characterization in this movie. And I just think that this kind of shows that sometimes the characters that we don't want to see turn out to be some of the best ones. Kevin Bacon's okay. I like how he's the one who gives Magneto his helmet, but, you know, he, he's just not a great villain. And Moira McTaggart is also kind of okay. I like how she's kind of a spy, but I think that the whole love interest thing with Charles is just not anything, you know, super mind-blowing. Also, the third act is freaking incredible. I think it's genuinely one of the best ones in any superhero movie that I've ever seen. Magneto stops hundreds of missiles in midair doesn't even break a sweat. Ah, ah, ah. Love this guy. I love this movie. This is a great movie. I will watch this one again 100%. For me, I'm giving it an 8 out of 10. Two words Daddy Magneto. Next movie. Okay, all jokes aside. Oh my god, this is a good movie. This movie is nearly a masterpiece. And I say nearly because there are a couple things that bring it down. And most of those are just kind of weird decisions. Uh, number one, JFK is a mutant. I, uh, can move objects with my mind. Uh, oh yeah, also, just out of nowhere, they make Kitty Pride have the ability to send other people back in time. Since when could she do that? Did you upgrade your skill tray or something? Also, they do just kind of ignore, like, most continuity. Remember how Patty Stu died in The Last Stand? He's back, baby. He came back in the post credit scene for the Wolverine with zero explanation other than, Oi, bruv, I got me ways in it. it. It really does feel like there's a movie and a half missing here. Uh, however, apart from those weird decisions, everything that this movie does is just incredible. The action scenes are incredible, the writing is good, the plot works so well and handles the convoluted nature of time travel well enough to where it doesn't become confusing. Basically what I'm trying to say, this is awesome. This is the movie that sold me on this franchise and is probably the one that I'm gonna be the most excited to, to come back to if I ever watch all the X-Men movies again. I'm gonna give it a nine out of 10. 
man, that was a good movie. I really can't wait to see where this goes from here. I don't really have a lot of problems with this movie, and I know a lot of people do, but this movie ain't great. I think Apocalypse on his own is a pretty mediocre villain. I think he suits the story well, and, you know, his actions are good, but I genuinely think that all of the characters that he hires to go along with him to do those actions have more potential and are more interesting in general. And I am not super keen on the younger versions of the rest of the team. They don't really do a bad job. Like, I don't really think they're bad casting choices, but... I don't really think they do the greatest job. Ultimately though, I think this all comes down to the direction. And Brian Singer is a well-respected and good director who doesn't have any kind of deplorable allegations made against him. Oh no. When that, that bunk, that bunk done, God damn it. Now I do want to point out some of the good because I think there are good things in this movie. Magneto. Just, just Magneto. That's, that's all you need to know. I think that the whole Quicksilver mansion scene is the best, like, Quicksilver speed scene out of the two of them that we got. In general, I think that this movie just kind of suffers from the last stand syndrome. Nothing's good, nothing's bad, but it's just kind of underwhelming. So yeah, this movie gets too much hate, in my opinion, but it doesn't mean it's that good. I'm gonna give it a 5 out of 10. It can't get worse, right? It can and it will, and here it is. This movie makes me sad. It's not good. It's, it's not good at all. I'm gonna try to get positives out of the way first. Um, you guessed it, Magneto. He's genuinely the best part of this movie because he's the only person who actually does something cool. Now, compared to what he does in the last movies, it's pretty lame. I mean, he just kind of lifts a train out of the ground. But Magnet Man do Magnet Thing and it make try an ape brain smile. Okay, other positives. Other positives, other positives, um, oh yeah, there aren't any. Everything that this movie tries to do just fails and falls flat on its face, straight into a cow pie. He's the of I think that Phoenix sucks. I wasn't really a fan of Sophie Turner's Jean Grey in the last movie, and I think this movie just made it worse. It's not because she's a bad actress. She just suffered from bad direction. Oh yeah, uh, also Mystique dies totally unceremoniously. And of course she utters the worst line in a script ever probably. And by the way, the women are always saving the men around here. You might want to think about changing the name to ex-women. You know, I changed my mind, kill yourself. One of the best characters from like the last two movies, Quicksilver, he gets his leg broken. He gets his leg broken. Nightcrawler, he gets a bloodlust. No reason why, never gets resolved. They just had no clue how to do anything, didn't they? Didn't they? So yeah, this is meant to be the finale of the universe. Charles and Eric retire for the 15 millionth time and they rename the school to Jean Grey, yada, yada, yada. Charles condoned renaming his life's work after the girl who killed his closest childhood friend. They did that. Uh, this movie sucks. I hate it. Two out of ten. I'm getting an aneurysm from even thinking about it. Just call me anus. Out of all these movies, this is one of the few where I feel like I can comfortably call it a classic. This is one of the best origin movies I've ever seen. Like, it's told, narrated, and sort of flashed back to while we're seeing an already established character. I think that's a great way to do it. And I think that seeing those origins in this amount of detail, and maybe too much detail, really does allow the audience to connect with Wade a lot. He genuinely loses everything, and instead of dealing with that loss, he takes out his anger by becoming a vigilante and killing a bunch of people, and he like puts off actually dealing with the mental stress that comes with it by just cracking jokes at every single opportunity. This is a straight up comedy, and unlike some of the other Marvel movies, it works well and doesn't feel forced. But Deadpool is a movie that manages to balance comedy at the forefront with a genuinely kind of heartwarming and touching story. Like, the whole message behind it is true love can actually go beyond physical appearance. Yeah, that's the message behind the same movie as this joke. Oh, I so pity the dude who pressures her into prom sex. Plot-wise, it's 
Definitely a revenge movie. Wade wants to hunt down the people who tortured him, made him lose everything, yada yada yada. Again, it's one of those just basic plots, but again, I think that's what you need for something early on. Uh, in terms of like comedy, I think this one's good, but I think that the overwhelming amount of sex jokes can get a little stale. I don't know, humor's subjective and it's kind of hard to talk about. So let's move on. I think that the action is great, the plot is appealing, the characters are great. I think that this movie's a classic. I think this is maybe the perfect way to do an R-rated superhero movie. So for me, I'm gonna give Deadpool a nine out of 10. I don't know a ton about the X-Men universe. I mean, really my only experience prior to these movies was the show X-Men Evolution, if any of you guys remember that. In that show, there was this one episode about Rogue meeting a Native American mutant named Danielle Moonstar. And that episode absolutely terrified me as a kid. But looking back, I think it was really well made and Danielle Moonstar is one of the most interesting characters in the X-Men universe. So when I heard that she was going to be the main character of a movie, I actually kind of had pretty high hopes. This is the final movie released from the X-Men universe, and so that also added a lot of stakes to it. After 20 years of an interconnected film franchise, this was it. This was the grand finale. So how did they do? Awfully. This movie is awful. I don't like a single one of the characters. None of them. Except for Roberto. I don't know why. I, I just like him. Maybe it's because he's like never in it and doesn't do anything to make me hate him. But I, I just connect with Roberto. Danielle Moonstar should be an interesting character. But she just isn't. She quite literally has like the most interesting power in the whole franchise. And they manage to make her boring. Stranger Things man is weird. He can't do a southern accent. Anya Taylor-Joy, the girl from The Vivitch, is in this movie, and is a MASSIVE racist! <laughs> I mean, it's like half of her character. The other half is like her own bootleg version of Mr. Hat from South Park. <laughs> and then we get to Wolf Lady, played by Maisie Williams. You know, from Game of Thrones? Now granted, I haven't seen Game of Thrones, so I can't speak on how she is in that. But in this, she is genuinely the worst character. There's just something about her that doesn't work. Maybe it's because, like, the CGI that represents her powers isn't great. Maybe it's because she's not written well. Maybe it's because it's this movie. It's so boring. Stuff just kind of happens. There's no weight. A huge part of this movie that just doesn't feel built up to at all is the romance between Maisie Williams and Danielle Moonstar. I will say... Props to the movie for having, like, a lesbian relationship front and center. It's not often for movies to do that. You just didn't write it well. Like, at all. Or do anything right with this movie. Um, for me, I'm gonna give New Mutants a 1 out of 10. I hated it. Uh, you should have delayed this movie indefinitely. And into a bonfire. <laughs> oh. My. God. That's it. Oh. My. God. This movie is incredible. I don't think it's too much of a stretch to say that, you know, at least in terms of what we've gotten right now, Logan is Marvel's equivalent to the Dark Knight. But before we get into how freaking good this movie is, I wanted to acknowledge some negatives. The villains are just kind of okay. I think that the three of the main villains together form one good one, but separately, they aren't the greatest antagonists. Uh, really, the only other negative I can think about is the sheer amount of swearing in this movie. Like, they wanted to utilize the R rating as much as possible, and it makes sense, but a lot of it just kind of feels unnatural. No one should live like this, drugs in a fucking tank. For your own good. No, no. However, the positives in this movie far outweigh the negatives. I mean, far outweigh the negatives. Uh, for example, the characters. Seeing Charles in the state he's in is genuinely just depressing. I just want to give him a hug. I just want to let him know that, like, everything's gonna be okay. You know what I mean? Laura is awesome. 
She is such a good character. I really like how she has basically no control over her powers, because that kind of allows Wolverine to fill a mentorship role, which I think for someone's final appearance is one of the best ways to make that last appearance matter. Uh, speaking of Logan, he's just turned up to 11. Granted, he, he is a shell of the hero that he used to be, but I think that that fits this Western vibe perfectly. The action scenes are very well done and are very brutal. Pretty much everything that this movie does is just done perfectly. Yeah, few missteps here and there, but I think that the overwhelming positives that this movie has really make it one of, if not the best Marvel movie ever made. So for me, Logan very easily gets a 10 out of 10. I think Deadpool 2 is pretty much just as good as the first one. That doesn't mean it's perfect, but I don't I don't know. It it kind of balances out. Negatives, I think the comedy is worse. Like it's still funny, but it's more topical than the first one. So even though it's pretty funny now, I think in, you know, a few years it's not really going to be funny anymore. Like they play Bangarang by Skrillex twice. I guess dubstep never dies. <laughs> Also, the storyline is a little bit less appealing. Like, I like some of it. You know, I like X-Force, I like Cable, but I think that a lot of the other stuff is just kind of meh. I don't like the kid with fire powers. I genuinely forget his name. I just think he's kind of annoying, and he just drags the movie down a little bit. I do like a lot of the other things in this movie, though. In terms of the positives, I actually think Deadpool 2 kind of does a couple things better than the first one. Like, a huge one is the action. It is so damn good. I also think it's kind of shot quite a bit better. So I think overall they kind of even out in my eyes, but I don't know. I'm, I'm probably going to personally take Deadpool 1 over Deadpool 2. For me, I love how the post credit scene returns to the movie that, you know, I started this whole journey with. And it's an awesome full circle moment. Overall, I'm going to give Deadpool 2 an 8 out of 10. And that is all of the X-Men movies. It only gets worse from here. Fantastic Four is a strange movie. It's from that, like, Raimi Spider-Man era where superhero movies just started to boom, but at the same time, they hadn't really found their footing yet. I'm gonna start off by going over some negatives. Uh, this movie's cheesy. Also, there's, like, gratuitous sex appeal with Susan Storm having to strip down naked in order to help the thing. Um, you didn't need to do that, guys. Doctor Doom is not a good villain until he is actually Doctor Doom. I really like him, but I think that the way that we got to the finale Doctor Doom just wasn't great. And I'm also not really sure how I feel about the Fantastic Four being celebrities. I think it sort of undermines the heroic aspects and lessens the impact that they have. But other than that, I think most of this movie is just kind of okay. The group's origin is interesting. I just wish that it was fleshed out a little more. Each of the members of the group have their own place, and I think that they really do work well together dynamically. I just think that individually, they don't really have a lot of character moments that make me care about them. Overall, I think this movie's good. I don't mind it. You know, it's just not really super special, and I don't really think I'm gonna go back to revisit it often. I'm gonna give it a six out of 10. Giga Chad Reed. I honestly don't know how to feel about this movie. On paper, that's not really much different than the last one. You know, it feels the same, the cast is the same, and it's got some good character moments, but I think there's just something about this movie that makes me green with jealous rage right now. And I think that it's really some of the details that bring this movie down a lot. For example, Susan Storm's eyes. Why are they terrifying? Do not look into her eyes, men! The souls of the damned swirl infinitely in the blue. The whole subplot of the group switching powers feels kind of like an episode of, like, superhero Seinfeld than, you know, a Fantastic Four movie. Also, Galactus is lame. He should have been a big purple horny dude, not a cloud. And then Silver Surfer is also kind of bad. Uh, okay, I take back what I said. Um, a lot of this movie is bad. <laughs> Doctor Doom is bad again, but he's got a couple good moments. I think that the dynamic of the Fantastic Four themselves stays the same. 
but not in a good way. I think that they really should have built off of what they established in the last movie, and I don't really think they do that. It feels like most of this was just kind of a bunch of ideas that were left on the cutting room floor of the last movie. I'm just disappointed more than anything. It's just this movie kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. So overall, I'm just going to give Rise of Silver Surfer a 2 out of 10. I don't like it. The eyes! The eyes! 2015 was a strange time. The MCU was just starting to establish its chokehold on pop culture. Days of Future Past was just released, and pretty much everyone loved it. And then the announcement of, like, Batman vs. Superman was just incredibly exciting to superhero movie fans. All of this super hype culminated with the release of Josh Trank's Fantastic Four. Hopes were high, the trailers made it seem like there was a more grounded interpretation of the team, almost with a horror vibe, and people were eating it up. Fans of the old Fantastic Four were excited to see a new interpretation. Fans of just superhero movies in general were excited of it. Oh, the hype. Oh, the excitement. So the fateful day that Fant Forstick hit theaters, everyone was excited, on the edge of their seats. And what they were met with was... And I speak no hyperbole when I say this. The worst superhero movie ever made. I am being 100% serious. This is maybe the worst thing I have ever seen. This is a movie that fails at basic storytelling. None of the characters know each other. The human torch and the thing don't even speak speak to one another until the final scene of the movie. How about two guys, a girl, and the thing that nobody wanted? Reed Richards is relentlessly unlikable. No, screw it. Every single character is relentlessly unlikable. Doctor Doom is cool for two seconds, and then you realize how much of a boring villain he actually is. And any and all badassery gets worn off so fast. They got their superpowers because they were drunk. They went drunk into another dimension. The pacing of this movie is just abysmal. The first time we see these superheroes do superhero things in a superhero movie is the final battle in the third act. Also, the beloved fan favorite character, The Thing, has 43 confirmed ki- I- mm. Uh-uh. I can't do it. The acting is wooden, the story is bland, the villain is awful, the characters are unlikable, the cinematography is aggressively mediocre, the VFX are passable at best, the writing is angering, the potential is completely wasted. Ladies, gentlemen, and everyone in between, this is the single worst movie I have ever seen in my entire life. I can very comfortably give this movie a 1 out of 10, but that is being generous. So, after the train wreck that was Fant Forstick, I decided it would be a good idea to add a movie to the list that wasn't there originally. The never officially released 1994 Fantastic Four movie. And it is actually nowhere near as bad. It's still bad. But it succeeds at a ton of things that Fant Forstick could never even dream of. First off, there are connections between the characters. Oh my god, these people know each other and like each other. The villain is mediocre, but this is a better version of Doctor Doom than Fant Forstick. Hell, you could take a wrapper off of an aluminum can and tape some green felt to it and you'd have a better Doctor Doom than Fant Forstick. Actually, here it is. I did that. Also, there's a second villain who's just a gremlin. But for the most part, I think that the low budgetness of this movie is what brings it down more than anything else. I think that with a proper budget and, you know, proper anything, this movie actually could have been really good. Here, take your own blood. Okay. If only the studio tried and didn't make this movie just to retain the rights to these characters. I'm gonna give it a 3 out of 10. It's not all that fantastic. Okay, Japs are better open. Okay, I'm gonna... I'm gonna say something that's been on my chest for a really long time now. Uh, I feel like I can finally speak my truth and open my heart to everybody. 
Um, this used to be my favorite Spider-Man movie. It isn't anymore, and I'm gonna get to that in a second. But I mean, damn, this movie goes hard. Green Goblin is one of the best villains in any comic book movie ever. Willem Dafoe's performance is just off the charts. He's intimidating, terrifying, and just goofy enough to where he never loses his edge. Tobey's Spider-Man is good. I don't think he's all that good, but he's good. Moreover, I think it's the representation of his character rather than the actual performance that makes him overall the best. His Peter Parker, on the other hand, absolutely perfect. Mary Jane is a punk-ass word that I don't want to say and should be the last choice for Peter. Best Uncle Ben, this is the best Uncle Ben. And Best Aunt May, this is the best Aunt May. Plot-wise, this is the best origin story that we have ever gotten for Spider-Man on screen. It never really overstays its welcome, and I think it really feels natural. Like the first X-Men movie, it's pretty basic, but again, that's exactly what you need, and I think it just works beautifully for this movie. The only negative that I can really point out is that it's kinda cheesy. Cheese. But that's really the only negative that I can even think of for this movie. Genuinely, damn good movie. Practically nothing wrong with it. Nine out of ten. I'll make that deal. How about you, you bitch? You make that deal? I make that deal. I don't blame you. Damn good deal. So why have I finally caved? Why do I think that this one is the best of the trilogy? Well, it's actually kind of simple. This movie takes everything good about the last one and improves on it just enough to where it edges it out. Doc Ock is not a better villain than Green Goblin, but I think he's a more compelling character. He feels way more human, and we actually see how his relationship with Peter rises and falls in real time, rather than, you know, the previously established off-screen relationship he had with Norman. And also, this is how you do a superhero loses his powers storyline. In The Wolverine, he gets his powers taken from him, and that works for that movie, but I don't really think it's the way you do it. However, in Spider-Man 2, he loses his powers by willingly giving them up. The stress of his life makes his Spider-Man powers go away, and that makes Peter decide to hang up the mantle entirely. And through this movie, he learns that he needs to find balance between the two alter egos that he has, rather than just choose one. And through all of this, he reconciles the mistakes that he's made in the most Spider-Man way possible. Mary Jane still sucks, she always sucks, at least as a person. Harry Osborn gets majorly expanded on in this movie. He's sort of a side character in the last one, and in this one, he's basically a main character. And James Franco is a non-controversial and good actor who doesn't have any sort of negative allegations against him that have been confirmed by multiple sources. Oh no. When that, that bunk, that bunk done. Anyway, this movie is incredible. I would genuinely say that this is the perfect example of everything that a comic book movie should be. Character driven, awesome action, great characters, a villain that we can simultaneously sympathize with and also be intimidated by. It, it just all works. I can't really say anything about this movie that hasn't already been said, so I'm just gonna leave it here. Absolutely awesome. 10 out of 10. Also, COMMUNITY REFERENCE! Where did they go so wrong? A lot of people tend to not mind this movie. Uh, I am not one of those people. I don't think it's bad, not at all. There are a lot of very good ideas in this movie. In fact, there are way too many good ideas in this movie. Uh, so many good ideas, in fact, that some of them get turned into bad ones. Like Peter Parker's personality perpetually participating in programs that prove to be painful places. Emo Spidey, oh, sorry. Bully Maguire gets memed on so hard that it does make him more enjoyable to watch, but it's bad. It's, it's bad. One thing that often gets pointed out about these movies is the fact that there are too many villains, and I agree. All of them are good on paper, but the execution doesn't really make them good. Topher Grace's Venom is the worst offender of this. Mainly due to the fact that Avi Arad forced Sam Raimi to put him in this movie. New Goblin is probably the best villain in this movie, but I think that he could have been a little better. I just think if he had more space to breathe, he would have been more appealing overall. Same with Sandman. Very good, very emotionally charged, but he should have had more room to breathe. Everything in this movie feels both overstuffed and underutilized. There's too much plot to make the plot plot. This movie feels kind of like a battle between the director and the studio, and we don't know who won this battle, but we do know who lost. 
the audience. Spider-Man 3, unfortunately for me, gets a 5 out of 10. You can fight, but you can't think. You can't do either. <laughs> what is this thing? This man thing? This is the most obscure movie that I watched on this list, uh, and it kind of deserves it. Oh, fuck! I'm gonna be honest, I don't really remember much from it. It's just a campy horror movie where the titular character is never seen except for like the last five minutes. I like the campiness. I think it adds a bit. It makes me a little more forgiving. You know, who doesn't like a good campy horror movie? Um, but yeah, uh, it's bad. It's terrible. Everything about it is bad. Acting, writing, directing, plot, characters, just everything. The most notable thing about this movie is maybe the fact that it has an original song written for it. I am not joking. <laughs> it's probably the most worthwhile thing from this movie. So yeah, it's 2 out of 10. Let's move on. Okay, this is the halfway point. Um, I'm gonna give you a break. If you need to take a, a fat duke, or water the plants, go ahead and do that now. Um, if you want to get some popcorn, maybe a drink, I don't know if you're enjoying it. Um, also you could just, you know, go into the description and do what every single person on YouTube tells you to do. I don't even need to say it. You know what you need to do. Why don't you do it? Why don't you go ahead and do it? It's right down there. It's easy. It's not difficult. How will you not benefit from it? Give me one good reason as to why you would not benefit. I'm just kidding, I can't tell you what to do. Alright, let's move on. This is getting weird. Oddly enough, I don't hate this movie as much as I hate some of the other ones. It isn't good. It's not good whatsoever. Like, the 90s Fantastic Four movie is better. But it's funny, low budget, and it's just got the charm that comes along with that. Captain America's origins are just completely skipped over, but his character's not really assassinated in, like, any way. Um, except for the fact that he's a socialist. I love you, Bernie! Red Skull, on the other hand, is absolutely botched. Uh, first off, bro's Italian. An American, just when I am needing help on my English lessons. Second off, bro's got a schnoz. Third off, he isn't even Red Skull for 90% of the movie. His face just is normal with, like, it looks like there is an earthquake. Captain America's casting is actually pretty good. I think the dude kind of pulls it off well, and I think that he could have killed it if the movie was given, you know, anything good. Also, just, this movie's hilarious. Captain America fakes being carsick to lure a driver out of the car only so he can steal it himself twice. Sharon, could you pull over for a minute? I think I'm gonna be sick. Captain America is carsick? Also, remember in the first Avenger when the assassination of, you know, the scientist who gives Captain America his powers is like this huge moment and there's this epic explosion and everyone's confused. Um, here's how it happens in this movie. I'd like you to meet Richard Ehrlich. He's a special observer sent by President Roosevelt. Oh, remarkable work, Dr. Vasselli. Congratulations. But the plot does kind of seem like it actually has some thought put into it, which is actually better than the Fantastic Four, whose third act just kind of happens. There's also kind of some good character moments in this. Like, I don't mind it, but I think this movie is just dragged down so far by bad acting, cheesy, well, everything, and it just reeks of a budget of $31 and a pack of tropical Tic Tacs. So yeah, this actually could have been serviceable with a proper budget, but since it didn't have that, uh, I'm gonna give it like a 2 out of 10. Uh, funny, but damn, it sucks half the time. But even after admitting this, there is no catharsis. My punishment continues to elude me, and I gain no deeper knowledge of myself. 
No new knowledge can be extracted from my telling. This confession has meant nothing. Wake me up! Wake me up inside! I think this is my favorite Marvel Legacy movie. Not because it's good, no, God no. The reason why this is my favorite is because this is the single funniest movie that I have ever seen. For reference, my favorite Marvel thing is the Daredevil TV show. It's perfect in practically every way in my opinion. So going into this, I knew a bit about Daredevil. And this is a complete assassination of everything that makes him a good character. He sleeps in a coffin. He sleeps in a coffin. There's this one scene, and it's the best one in the movie, where Elektra and Daredevil are training in tandem to bring me to life by Evanescence. It's beautiful. The portrayal of Kingpin is okay, I guess. He's not super intimidating and doesn't really do a lot, so as a main villain, his presence really isn't ever felt, but I mean, he's fine. Colin Farrell's bullseye, on the other hand, amazing. He is so enjoyable to watch. From the genuinely charming Irish accent to the goofy costume that makes rattlesnake noises. Bullseye. <laughs> Colin Farrell, ladies and gentlemen, he played the penguin. I wonder if he ever looks back on this, like, with regret. Maybe we can talk about what they did to my partner's face. Holy God, what are this you showing me? His head. Come on! Open your eyes! Uh, Story-wise, it's okay. You know, Daredevil's a serial killer, so it's hard to root for him. Yeah, Daredevil's a serial killer. Because of that, it suffers from Batman v Superman syndrome. Meaning that when the protagonist gets the chance to kill the antagonist, they don't go through with it even though they have literally killed every other adversary that has crossed their path and it makes no sense. Everything that happens in this movie is just cheesy, and most of the time downright stupid, and I love it to pieces. I mean, I'm serious. It is a dumpster fire that I can't look away from. I'm gonna give it a four out of 10. What are your superpowers again? I'm blind. <laughs> wow. Wow, I can totally see why this movie needed to exist. Elektra was okay in Daredevil. I, I think she got unceremoniously killed off, but she wasn't really much to write home about. So, of course, they decided to make a feature-length film dedicated to her. This is one of those where the plot is basically just stuff happens. There's no weight to it, no actual development. We just go from plot point to plot point to plot point aimlessly with mediocre action scenes tying the whole thing together. This movie serves as an origin story for Elektra, while also being a sequel to Daredevil? Uh, yeah, they decided to do that. The only reason why this movie exists is because of Jennifer Garner's contractual obligation to star in a sequel. And you can tell that she did not want to be there. But yeah, I don't have much to say about this movie. It's just bad. Just there for a perceived cash grab, when in reality, there wasn't one. I'm gonna give it a 2 out of 10. Just nothing to talk about. I like this movie quite a bit. Like, a bit, a bit. But before we get into that, there are a fair few negatives that I wanted to go over first. Uh, first off, why is Peter Parker a skater? Why did they do that? Why did they make that decision? That's weird. It's not bad, like, it works the way they do it. Uh, but why did they do it? Uh, secondly, the lizard is kind of a lame villain. I think he's more fit to be a secondary villain rather than the main one. Again, he works for this movie, but I think they could have chosen someone on a larger scale. The last negative is Spider-Man's bloodlust. Seriously, he, he never got the great power, great responsibility talk from Uncle Ben, at least not in the same way that we're used to. So after Ben dies, PD just kind of goes around and almost kills several people. The only thing that stops this rampage is a voicemail from Uncle Ben, rather than a super eventful way to learn the no-kill rule, like the Raimi movies did. But other than that, I do like this movie. Hot take, this suit is better than the one from the second one. It works for Andrew Garfield's physique more than the next one. Uh, speaking of, Andrew Garfield does a damn good job in this movie. I think that as the Spider-Man persona, he does the best job out of the three that we've gotten. Gwen is an okay love interest, but I think that the very obviously improvised romantic dialogue between her and Peter just kind of clashes with the rest of the dialogue that they actually wrote and kind of gets annoying after a while. 
What happened to your face? I want to tell you something. Oh. No, 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 no. Don't, no, don't, no. Okay, no. Forget that. I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk, talk about me, okay? What about you? It's impossible. Uh, the swinging scenes in this movie are damn incredible. Best ever. The final swinging scene before he fights the lizard is so damn cool. I mean, like, the people helped him. New York, you mess with one of us. You mess with all of us. I'm sorry, I have, I have no idea what came over me. Plus, the fight in the high school is one of the best scenes in any Spider-Man movie ever. B basically, just what I'm trying to say is, this is an amazing movie. Get it? Is the name of the film. And even though the representation of Spider-Man as a character isn't necessarily the greatest, this is a very unique take on a character and just an awesome movie overall with a lot of potential left over for a sequel. So for me, I'm going to give it an 8 out of 10. <laughs> the Rizzard. Avi Arad. Congratulations. You managed to take all of the potential left behind from the first movie and flush it down your $4 billion toilet. First off, positives. The swinging is good. Not as good as the last movie, but still pretty good. Andrew Garfield and Emma Stone are the exact same. Still good, still bad improvised dialogue. And the biggest positive of this movie is the soundtrack. It is genuinely a contender for the best one written for a Spider-Man movie. Now onto the negatives. EVERYTHING! You're a fraud, Spider-Man! Plot-wise, this movie is a mess. They try and fail to make some meaningful relationship drama between Gwen and Peter, which could have been interesting if something actually came of it. They just break up and get right back together again. Spider-Man's parents are dumb, stupid, dumb, and bad. They shouldn't have anything to do with Spider-Man, but in this one, they have everything to do with Spider-Man. Harry Osborn is horrendous. Dane DeHaan is not a bad actor, but he should be the last choice to play Harry Osborn. I will say, this is the best Green Goblin design from the neck down. Cause you look up and BOOM! Med face! Electro sucks. He's the better villain of the two, but just not good. He's cheesy, stupid, and he sounds like he was written by a five-year-old. His whole thing is basically telling Spidey, You're not invited to my birthday party anymore. Wah, wah, wah. Gwen's death is one of the better parts of this movie. You know, if you could ignore, BOOM! Med face! Overall, the fight choreography, cinematography, and acting is good. But so much of this movie is just bad. I think that, at least with the ideas presented here, there is a good movie that could have been made. Not one that's better than the last one, but maybe as good. And it just straight up wasn't. I don't like this. I don't understand why people like this. I'm gonna give it a 4 out of- BOOM! MED FACE! Man. This movie is awful. I know that a lot of people don't mind this movie, but I, I don't see why. The editing is very jarring. It's cool conceptually, but I think they try to juxtapose that comic book come to life editing with a serious tone, and I think that that just clashes intensely. Sam Elliott is the Roberto of this movie, meaning that he's the only thing that genuinely makes this movie enjoyable. That and this one, like, 15 minute sequence towards the end. Seriously, I could watch that chase scene on repeat. It is so damn cool that it bumps this movie up a point. However, that's where pretty much all positivity stops. Because, two words. Hulk dogs. There is a scene where the Incredible Hulk fights Hulkified dogs and punches them in the balls. <laughs> Avia Rod. Avia Rod. The villain is sucky. It's Hulk's dad slash absorbing man slash... Charles Manson. Are you mad? Uh, do you feel like wolves kebab fried frannets? Get frannets, boots, 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 Eric Bana does an okay job as Bruce Banner. Nothing really notable, though. Betty Ross is very underutilized in this movie. Uh, like I said, Sam Elliott steals the damn show. He is very easily the best part of this movie. I mean, just look at this scene right here. Show me the tit on a strawberry. Plot-wise, this is actually kind of good. However, the presentation of this said story is kind of lackluster. And by lackluster, I mean BORING! 
<laughs> Seriously, this movie feels like six hours. Like it's a very slow burn. And for a movie about a big green monster who smash, it don't work. So yeah, I'm gonna give Hulk a three out of 10. Let's move on. Blade is the biggest badass in history. There is just no question about it. I'm gonna say this, Blade is a very interesting character and the action in this movie is good, but a lot of it's just kind of meh. Like the love interest is kind of bland. You could remove her from the story and other than giving Blade a new weapon halfway through, nothing would have changed. Harvey Bullock from Gotham plays Jesse Pinkman, except Aaron Paul never left the corn video that he starred in. The villain is bad, like really bad. I think that the average Discord moderator that just shows up halfway through the movie is a more appealing character than he is. Also, Chris Christopherson is in this. Why? I don't know. He also may or may not unalive himself halfway through. Wow! Okay! Th th thanks, I guess! But with all of the flaws that Blade has, it makes up for it tenfold with the action. It's actually choreographed pretty well. I mean, like, you can tell it's from that Matrix era when CGI just started becoming an industry standard and action heroes in black leather were, like, expected and required. The third act is exactly what you'd expect from a late 90s vampire movie. A bunch of martial arts in a temple. Overall, I'm gonna say that Blade is probably gonna be the bar for superhero movies for me. Like, it's easy to do better, but it's also hard to do worse. So for me, I'm gonna give it a seven out of 10. There's plenty I don't like about you, but I have the good manners to keep my mouth shut. I shouldn't like this. I just shouldn't. It's cheesy, it's goofy, the acting isn't great, and the whole vampire world is just unnecessarily uncool, but Man, I love this movie. Like, it's an extension of the last one in terms of everything good, except it has a way better villain and a bland love interest that really isn't bringing it down. Now, the love interest in this movie is worse, don't get me wrong, but she's at least more interesting conceptually. Uh, Chris Christopherson comes back, you know, why not? Ron Perlman is doing Ron Perlman things, meaning he's being badass and stealing every scene he's in. If only he had a better haircut. I'd be crying if I look like that too, bro. That's fucked up what they be doing to y'all. All of the great action from the last movie is just elevated and more refined. Like, the final fight scene where Blade fights Nomak is really well made, but the best one is where Blade fights through waves of vampires using his fists, kills Ron Perlman, and catches his sunglasses in mid-air afterwards. Blade! Hell yeah! Blade, to me, is the gold standard of goofy superhero action movies, and there is not a doubt in my mind about that. I love this movie to bits, unironically. I'm gonna give it an 8 out of 10. Holy crap! You are creepy as shit. Oh my god, this is awful. Like, everything that made the last two movies good is just gone. The acting is noticeably just so much worse. Everybody's acting. Motherfucker. I like that. The action is a huge downgrade. It's choreographed much worse and way cheesier. They kill off Chris Christopherson in a simultaneously anticlimactic way and an overdramatic way. Like, it has no impact, but it's shot to look like it has all of the impact and it would have had that much impact if he didn't die in the first one already. The villains are so unbelievably bad, they're basically fighting Scott Stapp from Creed if he was a vampire. Ryan Reynolds is in this and is just a worse version of Deadpool, but even with that, he is the best part of this movie. Whistler's daughter is kinda cool, but she's not as cool as anything in any of the other movies. The third act is okay, I guess. It's just very conventional. It's also like, the third fight scene. There's the intro scene, the scene where they break Blade out of prison, like an hour of nothing, and then the third act. This isn't a bad thing for most movies, but when it's the third Blade movie, where the action is the whole point, it's very disappointing. So yeah, Blade Trinity, three out of 10. You didn't even try. What the fuck? Oh, what the fuck? This is one of the earliest released movies in the watch through, and you can 100% tell. 
It is very 80s, but I think that kind of adds to the charm of this, surprisingly. Like, the action, the casting, the soundtrack, the writing, it's just the exact movie that you'd expect from a late 80s superhero movie. It's full of guns, explosions, martial arts, and Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> However, since this is a late 80s superhero movie, there is a lot of negativity that also comes along with it. The acting, the writing, and the soundtrack all suck. The director of this movie has only directed one other. And there's a reason why he doesn't have that huge of a repertoire. Dolph Lundgren's performance is one of the worst out of all of these movies. You sure this is it? Uh, I'd stake my reputation on it if I had one. So is, one. you know, everybody else's. Red one, will you get off your ass? What? Everything's okay? Yeah. <laughs> if you want me to sum up the, uh, <clears throat> plot, it's basically this. Punisher shows up and shoots everybody. Cops argue about how they're gonna catch this guy. One of the crime families does something crime family-y. The Punisher gets sad about being the Punisher, rinse and repeat for one hour and 28 minutes. The writing is very stereotypical, tortured protagonist action movie. Frank is dead. The Mafia, Yakuza, whatevers, are written exactly like you'd expect. You get the point. And even though everything in this movie is written exactly like you'd expect, that doesn't mean it's written well. Or done well. At all. This movie is bad. This movie is really bad. Don't watch it. There's absolutely no reason to watch it. The Punisher is just a normal, cheesy, poorly made action movie that just so happens to include Frank Castle. If you want to watch it, do not expect anything more different than that. It gets a 3 out of 10. This movie was the real punishment. You didn't have to cut me off. Wow. It feels good to watch a movie that was somewhat competently made. Thomas Jane is, he's okay as the Punisher. He's better than Dolphy, easy, but when the bar is John Bernthal, it is a pretty hard role to pull off. Also, they kill his whole extended family. That is also a plot point that happens. I will say though, if this was a video game, the opening scene would be an incredible first mission. Actually, this whole movie is structured very similarly to a video game. Like, it's just a bunch of missions that just happen, but we just get to see the last cutscene. John Travolta fits the bill as stereotypical street-level mobster villain and does an okay job at it. Oh my god! But in terms of side characters, I don't really like any of them except for Dave. Dave's the best. But the goofball comedy duo that he's in really clashes with the tone of the My family is dead, and I'm going to murder everyone who did it movie. The other one is named Bumpo, for God's sake. This man's entire extended family was brutally murdered in front of him months ago. And they made him move in next to Bumpo. Actually, scratch that. The whole tone of this movie is just super inconsistent. Like, even for the comic relief, they get a little moment where they get, you know, tortured. This is minutes after the scene where they all dance to opera. But there are things that this movie does well. I like the Punisher mobile. The scene where bootleg Johnny Cash, who I'm gonna call Jimmy PayPal, tries to kill him on a bridge. I like it. I also like the scene where he fights Waldo. And the third act is pretty damn awesome. It's nice to see Punisher doing Punisher things for once. But overall, this is just a stereotypical action movie. Nothing too good, but nothing that makes me want to stab myself. It gets a 6 out of 10. I'd watch it again in like 5 years. This is not a better movie than the last one. Not by a long shot. The last one was generic and boring, sure, but there are points in this movie where it's just straight up bad. The action is goofy, the writing is bad, and literally everything is just incredibly over the top. But with all the bad stuff, this is so freaking fun to watch. There is a scene in this movie where a character named Looney Bin Jim destroys mirrors for like a minute straight. The Urban Free Flow Gang, I am not kidding, that's what this movie calls them, are just that one dude from Book of Boba Fett split into three characters. So much of this movie is ripped from a different one. The 1989 Batman movie. Jigsaw and Looney Bin Jim are just Jack Nicholson's Joker split in two. He ain't the only one can take the lore into his own hands. <laughs> and then Frankie Castle is just Keaton's Batman, the hero who's done this for a while and wonders if he should keep going because he thinks he's ultimately made things worse when really he hasn't, you know, that kind of thing. Also, Slipknot jump scare. 
Another weird thing about this movie is the unclarity if this is a direct sequel to the last Punisher movie. They change his origin a bit, so that means it's not a sequel, right? But the timeline matches up, so that means that it is a sequel? But if it is, Frank Gassel has gained one hell of a bloodlust, so that means it isn't? I don't care, let's get back to Italians getting violently manslaughtered. Yeah! Woo! Yeah! So yeah, Punisher Warzone, 5 out of 10. Basically a high budget fan film. Motorcycles, stuns, ghosts and skulls and fire. Extreme bad acting. This sort of western movie is incredible. I mean, it, they didn't even give Nick Cage a script. Are there any other calls? Uh... Yeah. It's so goofy, and it's just all around awful in the best ways. Howdy! Howdy, howdy, howdy. Ah uh ha, -huh, ah uh ha, -huh. give me that. Harvey Bullock's back. Why did he agree to do another one? I don't know, but he did. Sam Elliott's back too. Hey, what is this? Crossover episode? You know, I just, eh, eh. I can't do this anymore. Even though this movie is very enjoyable, it's just objectively awful. As with most of these movies, the villain, or should I say villains, aren't that great. They're basically just fighting my chemical romance. At the same time, the effects are pretty bad, so is the acting, the plot, the writing. Yeah, this is garbage. <laughs> but in all seriousness, I don't have a lot to say about this movie. It's super unique, goofy as hell, and Nicolas Cage is in it. This movie is just flat out fun. The only way that you can truly get what this movie is, is to just go and watch it yourself, which I genuinely do recommend. I'm gonna give Ghost Rider a 6 out of 10, just cause I had fun with it. This movie looks like it was shot on an iPhone 4. Honestly, any movie that makes Idris Elba suck at acting this much is gonna be awful. And let me tell you, this movie is awful. First off, Ghost Rider's in Europe for no reason. Everything that was set up in the ending to the last movie is just completely disregarded. At the end of the last movie, he decided to stay Ghost Rider since he wanted to use it to take down Satan. In this movie, he doesn't want to be Ghost Rider at all. So pretty much everything that it did to further Ghost Rider's character is just null and void. Also, he eats bullets and throws them up on someone on fire. I mean, literally everything in this movie is just god awful. I mean, the acting, the CGI, the action, all of it is just awful. When he ate bullets, I kind of wanted to, too. There is a Family Guy cutaway gag. Seven minutes, Seven minutes into the movie. My brothers are dead, as should I be, if not for the intervention of God. You know, I changed my mind. Kill yourself. This is a movie that's so bad that Nicolas Cage can't even save it. I mean, I mean, just, just look at this. <laughs> Scraping at the door. Scraping at the door. I genuinely can't even describe how much I hate this. I just can't. In fact, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. There is nothing redeeming about this movie. The only cool moment is when he turns the lumber saw thing into fire. Haha. <laughs> I wish that I was on fire. One out of ten. It's still better than Fant Four Stick. Quack, quack, bitch. George Lucas did this. George Lucas is responsible for this. This was George Lucas' next project after Return of the Jedi. He went straight from the end of one of the greatest film trilogies of all time to Howard the Duck. It's real. He's first in the credits. This movie was the first Marvel movie ever released and is so unbelievably absurd. I just don't even know what the hell this thing is. Every single thing that Howard says is a duck pun. I mean, without fail. I'm a dead duck. <laughs> Tim Robbins is in this. Yeah, as in the Shawshank Redemption Tim Robbins. It's nothing! 
It's nothing. Never mind. I genuinely have no idea what's going on in this movie. The acting sucks. The writing sucks. The pacing is going a mile a minute. And there is so much sex. A movie about a talking duck should not be this horny. The scene where Beverly and Howard try to have sex actually triggered my fight or flight response. I was, and I am not kidding, physically wincing. They introduce a villain in the Howard the Duck movie a whole hour in. And all he does for the first 15 minutes on screen is be the exposition machine. After that, he just does generic villain things and cheesy 80s movie one-liners. I want to see your license, Jack. I have no license. I am not Jack. <laughs> nothing, and I mean nothing that this movie does is done well. The only thing that looks good at all is the final form of the villain, but that's it. There is a 10 minute flying scene towards the end of the movie. I am already on my last legs at this point, and you're making me sit through 10 minutes of duck puns on a plane? Also, they do the sky beep. Every Marvel movie does the big blue sky beep. This one started it. George Lucas. George Lucas! Honestly, us Star Wars fans should have seen The Phantom Menace coming if this was the bull honkus he was coming out with before that. I mean, this movie has to be a masterpiece. I mean, there, there is no way that they could make a movie that makes me want to cry this much. It broke me. I'm broken. Two out of ten. <laughs> I, got that. I think I'm just kind of lukewarm about this movie. Tom Hardy does fine as Eddie Brock. I mean, he sounds drunk constantly, but it's also Tom Hardy, so he really doesn't do a bad job. The relationship drama between him and bootleg Kim Wexler is the most surface level stuff that I have ever seen. The first act is incredibly weak and boring and gloopless. Venom shows up exactly one hour in, and that is way too late. He should have been doing gloop stuff at least 30 minutes in. Instead, he gets the gloop 30 minutes in, and it takes 30 more minutes for the gloop to gloop at all. I will say though, Venom is freaking awesome. If Venom was any worse, then this would have suffered immensely. The action is so well done and is very easily the best part of this movie. I think that Riot is fine as a villain. It's just the normal, the villain is a darker version of the hero stereotype. Overall though, I just think that this movie is like a Ghost Rider era superhero movie that just was made in the modern age. It's a movie with really cool things like the action scenes, but the connective tissue holding everything together is just aggressively mediocre. So for me, I'm gonna give it a 5 out of 10. We are gloop. They are going to taste my venom! I got that it Carnage was teased in the last movie with the most subtle post credit scene in existence. Eddie Brock is back and is the exact same. Still sounds like he's coming down with the worst cold in history. What do you get? Uh, I got a headache and probably got tuberculosis. Probably got tuberculosis. Venom is also back and is way goofier. I'm not fine with a goofier Venom. I get that he can't be an unlikable bad guy forever, but I think that hearing him make pop culture references just feels off. At times, it actually kind of feels like they took a cut version of Venom from Family Guy and just put him in a full-length feature film. Terrible culture humor and all. So eat those guys! I can't! Sonny and Cher are best friends. Actually, all of the humor in this is horrible. It's just MC humor. <laughs> Except without the sound! It's almost like Sony wants to be as successful as the MCU, but due to their inability to consistently hire competent writers and directors, they will never get close to reaching the incredible heights that the MCU has, at least from a cultural standpoint and a basic filmmaking standpoint. In terms of positives, Woody Harrelson as Cletus Cassidy is genuinely perfect casting. He brings a lot to his character and does such a good job. Honestly, Carnage is kind of the only good character in this movie. The third act is cool. I think it's better than the one from the last movie, but mainly because the action is a lot easier to look at. God save us all! I don't like a lot of this movie, but I've seen worse. So for me, I'm gonna give Venom 2 a 5 out of 10 as well. Spider-Man just should have really been in these movies. Fuck this guy! Morbius, I got that acrimonious odious! This was the movie that I was the most excited about watching, believe it or not. I had seen it before, and recently. I bought it in 4K, no I'm not kidding, to watch with the guys on the trip where we made Cut It. After I watched it, I made the claim that it was the worst superhero movie ever made. However, through this whole journey, I had seen some awful movies. So, 
I was excited to watch this again, because compared to some of the others, I thought that Morbius actually had a shot at redemption. Did it take that shot? Uh, no. I mean everything. I mean everything that this movie does sucks. This is almost Fantforstic levels of bad. The only thing that puts this marginally above Fantforstic is that it's paced better. It doesn't take him an hour and a half to morb it up. After that though, I think it drags for way too long and ends way too quickly. The writing of these characters is just unbelievably bad that nothing matters, everything is weightless. There is one good line in the entire damn script. Listen, if you start quoting the notebook to me, I am going to stop and hobble very slowly in the opposite direction. Other than that, the acting is mediocre, the cinematography is sucky, and the CGI is some of the worst that I've ever seen. Honestly, the thing that makes this movie that much worse is that it has absolutely zero reason to exist. Like, at the baseline, I can accept that Fantforstic makes sense to be a movie that they decided to make. But I cannot process any logical reason as to why anyone in their right mind would greenlight a movie focused on a D-list Spider-Man villain that 90% of the population has never heard of. Who thought that this was the way to go? I just can't wrap my mind around this movie. Like, it's bad, but it's somehow not the worst one I've ever seen. It's at least made by people who can make a movie, and there's some semblance of a plot. It's just that overall, nothing from this movie is just worth it at all. So for me, Morbius gets a 1 out of 10. Well, this is it. This is what we ended on. The opening of this movie is so good. The Peter Parker monologue is done so well, and it genuinely fits the character of Spider-Man perfectly. Uh, also, COMMUNITY REFERENCE! It's, it's a COMMUNITY REFERENCE! Miles Morales is a very good character. I mean, just instantly he connects with the audience. From the moment you first see him, you're hooked. Also, the stylization of this movie is incredible. They made an oversized Green Goblin and Kingpin work. I also just love all the variants of Spider-Man. I will say though, Nicolas Cage Spider-Man is my favorite. Every villain in this is awesome. Well, almost every villain. Tombstone's just kind of there, so is Green Goblin, and so is Scorpion. But other than that, Doc Ock is genuinely badass. Her reveal scene is amazing. The audience genuinely doesn't even expect her to be Doc Ock, and it's one of the best subversions of expectations for a villain that I've ever seen. Prowler? Banger. I mean, I can't even put into words how cool he is. He serves as both a badass villain, and he fills the role of Uncle Ben for Miles. Also, his theme is the best and you can't talk about this movie without talking about Kingpin. I mean, you put the best Marvel villain in the same movie as the best Marvel hero, and you get one of the best dynamics that you can possibly ask for. If Logan is Marvel's Dark Knight in terms of tone, groundedness, and being everything that a comic book movie could be, this movie is Marvel's Dark Knight in terms of characterization and just being a flawless film in general. This is top three Marvel content. Like, the only competition is the Daredevil show and the Insomniac Spider-Man game. Truly amazing. The best way to end this off, and what a hell of a ride. 10 out of freaking 10. What we do here is go back, 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 back. Okay, so before I answer the questions and wrap up this video, I'm gonna drop my ranking of the movies, just because I thought, I don't know, that would be fun. They're all equally shit. Fantforstic, Morbius, The New Mutants, Ghost Rider Spirit of Vengeance, X-Men Dark Phoenix, Captain America, Man-Thing, Elektra, Howard the Duck, Fantastic Four Rise of the Silver Surfer, THE Fantastic Four, Blade Trinity, Hulk, 80's Punisher, X-Men Origins Wolverine, Daredevil, The Amazing Spider-Man 2, X-Men Apocalypse, Punisher Warzone, Venom Let There Be Carnage, Venom, X-Men The Last Stand, Spider-Man 3, The Punisher 2004, Ghost Rider, Fantastic Four 2005, The Wolverine, X-Men, Blade, Deadpool 2, Blade 2, X2, The Amazing Spider-Man, X-Men First Class, X-Men Days of Future Past, Deadpool, Spider-Man, Spider-Man 2, Logan, and in number one, Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. So, that's all the Marvel Legacy movies. 
I can't believe I did that to myself. So at the beginning of this video, I said that I would answer at least two questions. The first question I'm going to answer is, do these hold up? Uh, no. Most of these movies do not hold up, either to the test of time, basic filmmaking standards, or both. The ones that everyone talks about and remember do hold up, but movies like Elektra, Fantforstic, and Captain America absolutely do not. These movies vary wildly in quality, and it's really a 50-50 chance if you're gonna like most of these movies. The second question that I said I was gonna answer was, was this worth it? Absolutely yes it was. I loved this. Genuinely. It was so fun going through this. I mean, discovering some of the movies that I loved and some that I truly hated. I think that this whole experience was great and really led me to appreciate this genre of film even more. It's truly an incredible selection because every single one of these movies has its own identity. The Raimi trilogy is goofy and fun. Logan is a dark, gritty drama movie that perfectly wraps up the X-Men universe. Fantforstic is bad. Blade 2 is the bar for silly action movies from the 2000s. Deadpool is the perfect example of how to do a comedy movie with a superhero. Basically, while the quality may vary massively, the identities of each and every one of these movies also vary, and that is an invaluable experience. I wanted to thank you guys all for watching. Um, <laughs> this took a while, and I put a lot of work into it. So if you could just show your support in any way, I, it doesn't matter to me what it is, just it would mean a lot to me, and genuinely from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Okay, bye, see you next time. How'd I get in here? I wanted to thank you guys so much for watching this video, uh, it really means a lot. Um, and I think that you should like and subscribe, or I'm gonna have Josh Trank direct your life. You don't want Josh Trank to direct your life. Man, this is kind of this is kind of nice. I might I might want to stay in this frame for a while. I like it. Yeah.